I'm reviewing Noam Chomsky's Hegemony or Survival on my YouTube channel, kind of summarizing it page by page. I'll probably be working on these on most mornings for about a month, then I'll move on to the next book, which will probably be 12 Years a Slave. So I'm not necessarily only going to be doing political book reviews, but I do think that will be one of the main focuses here, and I'll just read fiction on the side. But anyway, uh, page one of Chomsky's book deals with whether we're better off as a species due to our higher intelligence, which allows the creation of civilization. It's an interesting question, and it's incredible to me that people even allow things like a president or a, or a pope. In fact, there's a great punk song by Zero Boys called Civilization's Dying that delves into how positions of power breed contempt rather than long-term stability, and how some of these people in power will probably be jeopardized by power-fearing lone gunmen and jealous lunatics, in addition to political conflict resulting from territorial overreach. I've long, or I've long thought that critical thinking has largely disappeared, and uh, even though that sounds condescending, I, I still think it's true. While violence actually isn't truly everywhere, it's true that homicide is still an ongoing phenomenon, and the system constantly tries to use it for its own gain, when not employing violence itself directly. In other words, it is immensely hypocritical. I mean, because of how unstable the system is now, I can reasonably wonder who will be killed by cops today. And because these actions only inspire more protests and occasional rioting and looting, which benefits the president and his base, it risks becoming a bizarre, vicious cycle. Meanwhile, the issue of police brutality and systemic abuse can be more easily lost in the scuffle. So obviously, being of a so-called higher intelligence has its disadvantages. Higher intelligence only allows for a higher degree of manipulation. So, we're moving on to page two now. That sort of asks if people are somewhat of a biological error due to the dangers we create for ourselves. Again, it's hard for me to say, no, there's nothing to that. For example, look at how certain men, even today, justify elements of strict patriarchal rule. Now, I know patriarchy can be an overinflated concept, and some feminists perhaps see the patriarchal boogeyman in places where it isn't. Still, it's undeniable that patriarchal institutions have existed in history and still exist to this day. Look at the Catholic Church, for example. Or, of course, you could always look at a uh, number of Islamic countries. But you could also look at the RNC. For example, Abby Johnson, a speaker at this year's Republican National Convention, has advocated head of household voting where the man's ultimately the head of household, and he decides the vote. Johnson reasoned that, quote, in a godly household, ick, the husband would get the final say. See, it all, it all makes sense to a, a fractured mind. She's also advocated racial profiling for her own adopted black son, among other things I needn't get into right now but go ahead and take a look at her uh, very odd history. These people, including some of the so-called incel community, also tend to argue from a place of biological determinism, or that people are just genetically predisposed to be criminals or otherwise inferior. While there might even be shades of truth to this regarding criminality, as genetics do ultimately play a role in virtually everything we do, there is nevertheless a difference between something being somewhat true or having shades of truth and making it the absolute law of the land. In terms of gender relations, the dismissal of women's rights goes something like this in these people's minds. I, I need to emphasize this is what some of these people seem to think. It's not what I think. But anyway, here it is. They think women are biologically inferior. 
through the bad luck of the sex and gender lottery. Because women sometimes have bad luck with losing this lottery, we might as well rig the system against everything else in their lives, even when they do everything the right way. Because of their reproductive system, they therefore deserve to have nothing else in their lives but a continuation of this bad luck and just accept their subservient role. Uh, that's basically the understanding of as I have seen it. This kind of thinking is still going on in the world, where women are regarded as if they're a biological error, yet men are aggrandized. You know, they'll, they'll say men have the high intelligence we can think for ourselves and know best, so we should be the ones to bear the burden of taking care of the world and making the hard decisions. So basically, in this belief system, women are like perfect petulant children who never listen, never learn, and constantly need male dominance. Of course, they would view it as guidance rather than a, a strict form of rule. Anyway, this kind of thinking still happens in 2020, and it was showcased at the Republican National Convention, which might, as stand, which might as well stand for a rapacious, narcissistic cult. Yes, America is a redneck stronghold, which, su which suggests that we've made some significant mistakes along the way. So anyway, moving on to page 3, uh, this page details uh, some of the environmental problems, and it suggests that the Bush administration reject, rejected even current rules regarding emissions, let alone future ones. They want for there to be no binding national limits or national targets. Indeed, they don't want us thinking about greenhouse gas emission reduction or greenhouse gases in general. And uh, my frequent argument regarding environmental pollution and, uh, and all that is go ahead and take a whiff of some car exhaust sometimes. You'll instantly know that it's probably not good for you. So, you, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to understand that there's at least something to this environmental talk, right? Is it really that far out there to actually just take a look at what's coming out of our own vehicles and see that mm, some of this stuff probably isn't good for us? To me, that's not a very extreme concept. So anyway, uh, page number four... That deals with the Iraq War and weapons of mass destruction, and how all these governments are inviting an eventual Armageddon. In addition to arms control, we should be actively involved in political compromises. Nuclear war was a major part of America's beliefs during the Cold War, and we held that the economic, or no, that the atomic age could bring the human race to destruction by weapons. It's possible that America believed that this eventual destruction of the human race was imminent, if not prophesied in the Bible. Admittedly, Chomsky doesn't get into the religious angles in this chapter, but America's tendencies toward theology certainly played into its warlike ways over the years, as well as the more general interests of empire building. Basically, if they lack a, a competing empire like the Soviet Union, or now either China or Russia, they'll have to invent a new enemy. If a distant comet could communicate, they would accuse it of trying to instigate a war. Meanwhile, during the opening credits of the whole Iraq war fiasco, Donald Rumsfeld is shown shaking hands with Saddam Hussein, and support for that dictator went all the way back to the Kennedy administration. So, chapter... Or not chapter 5, page 5 deals with the Great Beast, a.k.a. the American population. Um, it details the contempt even some of our founding fathers had for the U.S. population, with Alexander Hamilton comparing us collectively to a great beast that must be tamed by wise men, like himself, with a special ability. Of course, the state that was going to help him would always remain in the back, the backdrop, if not at the forefront. Uh, see, this by itself might partly explain why people don't really see eye to eye and share little to nothing a good chunk of the time. 
we've been shaped by a system of contempt against us. So what do many of us do? Head out to the pub and get a bit, get a bit too drunk? Feel sorry for ourselves? Rinse and repeat. And that might be life's journey. Now that includes becoming a pill popper or a meth head or maybe a religious fanatic. Anything that distracts us from the everyday reality that we've been screwed over for hundreds, arguably even thousands of years by people with power. But the convenient thing is, when every man thinks of himself as an island, he never really needs to see the big picture. If it's very cold, you should work to supply your own blanket. Anything else might result in two men fighting over a shared blanket. And if we make the metaphor large enough, we can say the figurative blanket covers the entire planet. The problem is, of course, that this proverbial blanket, if it's large enough, we might just want to be, be able to share it instead. But of course, that idea is considered outright demonic. So anyway, uh, moving on to page six, that page deals with President Wilson and propagandist Walter Lippmann, who theorized that the mass of mankind functioned as a bewildered herd who must be governed by a specialized class whose interests reach beyond the locality. He defended an elite class of intellectuals and experts to govern our lives, basically. So do our values largely reflect these interests today? Often they do. As per our stories of our lives, we often emulate these elevated ideals, aspiring to become them. Even if we'll never be in the top 1%, we love the rags-to-riches stories, although quite often the rags just get more tattered as the days go by. But here's how, here's how we might spend our days crafting ideals to reinforce what we just know to be true. That we are excellent, that we deserve all the good things, that we deserve to win, that we deserve a pat on the back, that we deserve accolades, that we deserve to be successful, that we deserve our place at the top, that we deserve to go on with our lives uncritically. Of course, most of us never do particularly well, and the system seems to reward or obedient people less and less each year, if not with each passing day. Still, we think that life will reward us if we just work hard and do our part to keep the machine well-oiled and lubricated with our blood, sweat, and tears. And so from childhood through to our teenage years, we learn how to work the system uh, to the best way of our ability. We dare, or we are supposed to dress to succeed, to make the grade, and to say how high when they say jump, and on and on. So anyway, on to page 7. That page deals more with the media and offers a tasty quote from James Madison about government existing to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. They should, right? Sarcasm on my part. And do we see these values represented today? Of course. Unfortunately, I believe in being honest, so I'm not interested in merely catering to the interests and whims of the well-off and well-educated edu well and the well-connected. Uh, it's a bit weird discussing this because, in a way, I act as an entertainment writer, as, <laughs> as uh, something I do semi-professionally, as I say. So I could easily be accused of writing some inane puff pieces. Uh, so this part sort of hit close to home with me. However, if anyone approaches me and says I should do something different, I could point to my blogs where I challenge people left, right, and center, or to some other YouTube videos I make, or even some of my episode recap articles where I deal with some more serious shows and topics. Though not all of my articles are serious, I try to sometimes write a pop culture analysis piece, and that will suffice to make people think. Hopefully. I love to think I'm not just some mindless proponent of the machine, so to speak, writing an endless barrage of fluff pieces. So, moving on to page 8, that continues about America's desire to control thinking throughout the world. Again, we can ask if there's any truth to this, and of course there is. As the United States has stomped around the globe, we can see it 
not only slaughter foreigners and support regimes and terror networks, but it also tries to force economic growth upon it. And now this has been confirmed as an indispensable part of old-school Reaganomics and as part of the so-called neoliberal framework. Freedom tends to mean give the corporations and the military more money, and if there's anything we consider a problem anywhere, it is Uncle Sam's role and responsibility to explore its options, which seem to always include to beat it, shoot it, bomb it, throw it in a cage, bury it, or at least encourage that bewildered herd to endlessly and uncritically spit venom, venom at it until it seems to go away. What Orwell called, I believe it's the two minutes hate or the three minutes hate, I don't remember the exact term offhand, but basically you just show some villain of the week or of the month and uh, <laughs> basically list a bunch of bad things about it, either real or imagined, and we're all just supposed to say, that's the bad guy right there. And, you know, we can set up dart boards and get out the uh, anti Khomeini flags and and the t-shirts and whatnot. And uh, we, we can participate in the bumper sticker aspects of politics. Almost nothing is truly intended to correct some of these errors that happen on the globe, nor is there anything perfectly coherent about the, about the conclusions reached by our enlightened leaders and propagandists. What's really happened is always what they want us to think, it seems. So, page 9 details developments in the so-called War on Terror, which was hardly ever even a true policy. Basically, it was just a blank check for the militarist system to do what it wants, when it wants, how it wants, and for whatever reason it chooses. And don't bother finding any fault with the process, because critical thought equals treason. And so we got the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and well beyond. If you think of propaganda here, you'll notice that Americans were never considered foreign troops in Afghanistan or Iraq. It seems like that says quite a lot unto itself, right? So finally, I'm on to page 10, and that has an interesting quote by journalist Julio Godoy. I, I might not be pronouncing that right, but anyway, his quote is, One is tempted to believe that some people in the White House worship Aztec gods with the offer of Central American blood. Pretty gory, right? And uh, it really kind of makes you think of how so much of this pro-war coverage that we had during the Bush administration didn't really focus on the brutal reality of, uh, you know, shooting somebody, dropping a bomb at, dropping a bomb on them, killing them uh, with your bare hand, wh whatever, you know. It just doesn't really get into the brutality of it. Unless, of course, uh, some American soldier was wounded. Then you can use it as a uh, propaganda piece, right? So this, of course, references Reagan-era warmongering, that quote, and why some might have been having trouble with the deal. It is fascinating how anytime there's a war, people are always perplexed by those who oppose it. They seem to have no clue why some are freaking out about it. Of course, the horrors of war are far easier to ignore when your house isn't the one getting bombed and you're not the one getting shot at. Then, of course, you'll hear their response, well, we have to bring the fight over there or they'll bring it over here. But that's exactly why people should be very cautious about this. If we, quote, bring the fight to so many different places, isn't it practical to assume that eventually some other people will bring the fight over here? And we've already seen that in some cases there's either no way of seeing the random terror, attack, terror attacks coming, or, of course, that the system actually even knows about it and does nothing about it. Meanwhile, if the system fails to prevent overt terrorism or random politically motivated murders, it can just serve as an excuse to give them even more resources, or money, or however you want to phrase it. In, term, in, in terms of uh, development, you know, they can just constantly keep building this thing, this endless war machine. In true Orwellian fashion, 
they don't really even need to use their spying powers effectively because they'll get the money for it either way. And when they do successfully liquidate a target, they can chalk it up as a major victory and get more funding that way as well. Meanwhile, few care about all the collateral damage along the way because civilian deaths are just another, another cost of doing business with Uncle Sam. So anyway, I'm done with pages 1 through 10. I'm sure some of you will not like this, <laughs> this approach to this book. Some of you will not like the book or my views on it, but whatever, you know. These are my opinions. And I will have a part two uh, either tomorrow or, or sometime this week, at least according to my plans. So be on the lookout for that.